Good afternoon. It's great to see everybody. Please get comfortable, take your seats. We're about to begin the program. Please, no food or drink other than bottled water or water. Thank you so much. We'll be starting in a moment, so please take your seats and get comfortable. If anybody needs a seat, just feel free to ask to step over or have people stand up and let you through. Okay, can everybody hear in the back? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I think we are ready to start, so please make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. So welcome to the Ekphrasis exhibition the president of the La Mirinda Arts Council would like to greet you. Yes, welcome. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I'm curious, have any of you ever attended an Ekphrasis event before? I understand they're going on in Marin and other places. Any of you? No? Oh, yes, one person. <laughs> so this is really a fabulous event, I think, to honor writers and um, artists. And I'm very happy to uh, introduce our mayor, uh, Inga Miller, who uh, has been, now it's her second term as mayor, right? And she's been on the Arts Council for years. Uh, we are so grateful for the Arts Council. It's due to them that we have all of the artifice around Orinda. I hope you have noticed that. We have uh, so many artists that have displayed their work. And uh, so, would you please uh, welcome Inga Miller. Sue, thank you so much. This is such an honor and a privilege to be here at this wonderful, wonderful event. And look at how many people, if we could only get so many people to our city council meetings. <laughs> this is just incredible. I think this is the most people we've seen in this room in a really long time. And it's not surprising when you have these three organizations that just bring people together in Arinda. And Sue, so you're so kind to mention the you know, art in public places and how much we so just are, are just so fortunate for all of the public art around Arinda that's made possible through our art, arts organizations. And this is such a special event because it brings together, you know, th three, three organizations worked extremely hard on this event. Of course, the La Mirinda Arts Council and the La Mirinda 
Arts Alliance and the California Writers Club. And it was just, it's, you know, as I heard about this event and heard people talking about it around town, there was just such an excitement about the idea of seeing the poems of artists. And people want to know, okay, am I going to see this artist's work or am I going to see their poetry? And in cases it was, it was both, it was just really, really exciting. And so this is just another endeavor that Arindans and Lafayette and Raga and our community has come together from far and wide to just en enliven our library spaces, to enlighten our residents. And this is just such a privilege and an honor to be here. And thank you so much. We are, we are so grateful for your work and for you being here today. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Linda Hartman, who is the past president of the California Writers Association. And she has been uh, very much involved in making all of this happen today. And she was telling me just a few minutes ago that there's uh, an annual Scholastic Art and Writing Awards for high school students. And all you have to do is go on the website if you know a high school student who is a, a writer, an aspiring writer, to enter. And I guess it's available for vets all over the world, right? Isn't that what you said? The military high school, right. And of course, I just want to remind you, the Arts Council also has an event for the high school students. We just finished it, uh, and their artwork was on display in, uh, I think it was uh, February for the high school students and March for the younger students. Um, but it, it's a, a way of our encouraging this creative endeavor, endeavor in our young people. So uh, would you welcome Linda Hartman. Well, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your busy days to support your family or friends who might be exhibiting some work today for the Ekphrasis exhibition. Um, I want to thank Mayor Miller for coming and introducing and kicking us off today. Thank you so much. I know with your busy schedule, that must be hard as well. So we're very honored to have you with us. Um, so basically, I wanted to see how many of you already knew what ekphrasis was when you walked in the door today, or was this something new for you? Raise your hand if you did know. Okay, good. So for those of you who do not, I didn't see all hands go up. Ekphrasis is an old Greek term, and back in the ancient days of poets and famous Michelangelo's and so forth, um, you would have these high-level poets write very detailed lyrical descriptions about statues and pieces of art in museums. Since then, it's come down and spread out to a further and further type of definition. It's not so crisp and clean, and we are now stretching that rubber band even further today. So instead of having just writers write a description of what they see in a painting or in a sculpture, we also have writers using their imaginations about what could be going on in that painting behind the scenes, you know? Who walked down that road every day and isn't doing it anymore? Where does your imagine take, imagination take you when you're looking at a piece of artwork? We're also doing it in a two-way fashion where artists are also creating visual art to respond to the written word. Now, a lot of people read poetry, read a story, read a book, read a novel, a magazine article, and images pop into your head, right? So if you're a visual artist, often that will take you places, like what led you into this painting, for example? What was your impetus? What inspired you? And so we're doing a two-way today where we have initiator artist, 
with writer respondents, and then we have initiator writers who started with something written and an artist who came and read it and responded to them. And that's why you see them side by side out in the gallery. So that's kind of the gist of what ekphrasis is. Um, so why did we establish this collaboration? I think it's because when I started learning about ekphrasis, I just totally fell in love with the idea. And in my research, I did not find that Contra Costa County has done an event like this before, and I thought it would be fun to do. So I took that to some of my artsy, creative friends, and they said, we're in. So after two years of establishing the concept, to today, um, for about a year and a half we've been meeting. It started like every two weeks and then it was weekly and sometimes it'd be monthly depending on travel schedules, but a lot over the phone, email, in person, on Zoom to bring this to fruition. And I thank all of you um, for helping with that and for the excitement in the author, the writing, the literary, and the artistic communities for getting excited enough to submit pieces for this event today. Um, so I think what we're going to do is start with um, just telling you a little bit about the three different establishments or organizations. They're all nonprofit, the California Writers Club, Mount Diablo Branch, which I'm the immediate past president for and current vice president. The La Mirinda Arts Council, which is used to doing a lot of art and writing events. And the La Mirinda Arts Alliance, which has a whole lot of artists that work underneath their organization. So I'm going to start by introducing you to the president of the La Mirinda Arts Alliance. So Donna Argenbright, may I have you come up? So LAA was founded in 1994, and I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of La Mirinda Arts Alliance, or LAA is the short term for it. It's an organization of artists. Uh, we're from mainly from La Mirinda, but anyone can join who would like to. And we have, in general, we have four exhibits a year. We try to provide opportunities for our artists to exhibit their work. And if you apply to ex an exhibit, you are guaranteed to have at least one piece in it. So we try to be universal and include everyone. Uh, we have educational events. We have one coming up where we're going to have um, uh, teach artists a little more about framing and, and how to do that. And that will be put into our permanent library for our members. Uh, we started back up our coffee clutches. We had just started them when COVID hit. And so we've just started those back up again. Uh, we have exhibits at Papillon now, and we will have probably once a month a coffee clutch there. We have a wonderful newsletter. Um, you can, if you go on and Google LAA for Arts or just La Mirinda Arts Alliance, you'll come to our website and all the newsletters are there so you can read about us and find out more about us. Uh, we have about, I think, 125 members. and. Um, we support the visual arts. So uh, that's a little bit about our history. And uh, we have information out, uh, brochures and cards. If you're interested in finding out more about us, please pick up one of those. Thank you. OK, in the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and um, begin with a pairing. We are going to have three different pairings. Um, come and speak to you about their work today um, to um, demonstrate the breadth of this we did not let the artist and writers know who they were paired with they had to go strictly on the anonymous visual piece or the anonymous piece of written work to choose what they wanted to respond to so nobody knew until today or yesterday who they were paired with so 
for each person, it has nothing to do with the person behind it. It has to do with the art or literature, the, the writing speaking for itself. It's like a blinded clinical trial. <laughs> um, all right, so I'd like to start. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the first pair of creatives. Um, we'll do Merrily Snow. If you could step up to the podium, please. Merrily Snow. She maintains a studio in Oakland where she was born. She's a painter, a photographer, a printmaker, and a collector of toothbrushes. You know, <laughs> creatives, right? Um, let's see, she uh, enjoys the uh, documenting time and, and places within her travels. She takes causes under her wing She's going to be talking about a piece called Have We Destroyed Ourselves Yet? And it's in a series. It's number five of, I think, nine that I saw online so far. And so I'm going to turn it over to her. And if you could advance the slide, please. Hi. I'm really proud and honored to be here. Thank you all. So this is Have We Destroyed Ourselves Yet? Number five, with the very happy title. <laughs> Maybe to make up for the very happy title, I am using bright, intense colors. So the, the visual space you are looking at is very flat. It's almost one-dimensional. Some figures are behind others, but still it's a flat, unmodulated space. I'm using, uh, I'm using my printing press. I have my own stencils that I roll up with a brayer, which is a one-handled roller. And then I take the stencil and put it face down on paper and roll it all through the press that transfers the color from the stencil onto the paper. Then when the paper is dry, about three or four or even five days later, I'm not the paper, but when the ink is dry, I sit down at my table and I start drawing and painting and I'm using acrylic gouache and aquarelle. So acrylic gouache in a way is a fancy name for poster paints, but it's, it's a very nice poster paint. It's flat, it's intense color, it doesn't reflect light and it dries quickly. And aquarelle is the fancy French name for water soluble colored pencils. So you can draw um, like the pink and reddish spiral in the center. Those multiple colors are from aquarelle. You draw with your colored pencil and then you can add water and it softens it. So that's what you see on the surface. You see shapes. We see two humans. One is running. One is praying, maybe begging, maybe beseeching, maybe crying. It's, it's not clear. We see spirals and orbs. They are my symbols for the atmosphere that we live in. And the suns, the spirals are suns, and they're my symbol for climate change, a hot sun. Along the bottom in black and purple, we see my version of a fence. It's actually supposed to represent the, the border wall. It's a permeable wall. It's an unfinished wall. It's a problematic wall. And we also see some coat hangers. Do you see the coat hangers flying around? Well, I realized that young people growing up today in their early adulthood might not get the symbology of coat hangers. But some of us older women in the days of illegal abortions, coat hangers were kind of a symbol, maybe a tool used for illegal abortions. And I did this piece right after the Supreme Court turned down Roe v. Wade 
in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women Health uh, suit. Around that time, I also read in Atlantic Magazine a quote from Thurgood Marshall in his last dissenting opinion before he left the Supreme Court. Oh, and he said, he cautioned the court to not overturn their previous decisions because by overturning their previous decisions, it could signify that, that the court was political, opinionated, um, it could lead to the decline of respect for the Supreme Court, for the rule of law, and even weaken democracy. So that's my piece. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. All right. Um, in response to this piece, can we have the next slide, please? So please keep this image in your head. And I would like to introduce you to Fran Kane. Fran uh, wrote a response to this unique piece of art and she titled hers, Have We Destroyed Ourselves Yet? Fran's an artist and a writer who lives in Lafayette, not far, and she decided to realize her dreams and participate in the creative world after her retirement from the corporate life. She's an advocate of lifelong journey learning and um, she had a mother who was very creative in the kitchen with crafts, with oil paints, and she picked up on that and decided she wanted for herself a creative path as well. Fran is both a visual artist and a writer. So, Fran. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to try to lower this. <laughs> So I was really moved by this piece, and this is my response. Um, the world is a topsy-turvy storm in vivid tones of primary colors of red, blue, and yellow, and secondary colors of orange, green, and purple. I never know from day to day whether to run away from it in panic or succumb to the pressures. I look at the news with one hand shielding my eyes afraid for our planet, our society, our children. I see so much suffering, but I search for balance with the good in the world. So many people caring, every day holding out their hands to help others in need, working to fix what is broken. Those are the people I want to emulate, the steadfast ones who know life has never been easy and that we prevail despite ourselves and our struggles. I strive to tame my worries, organize them, and keep them in their place. Life is a never-ending cyclone, vivid, moving, and changing. But by rearranging the colored shapes and squinting my eyes, I can see the rainbow. The violence of the storm only intensifies the colors once it has passed and the sun returns. It always does. Have we destroyed ourselves yet? My answer is no. Marilee, can we have you come back up, please? Are there any questions from the audience about either the writing or the art piece from Marilee and Fran? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I have a question like uh, for the character, the purple person sitting on the brain, there is a patch. Is that patch symbolizes any uh, idea or any thought process that makes the person or holding the person off? Okay. I so my question is in the, pur pur the person in the purple color has a patch on the brain. So is that symbolizes that uh, it's kind of something that's holding off? Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, for me, it seems like somebody, it, it is a thought in his brain that is holding him off. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thank you. Like a hole in the head of some kind. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, congratulations to both of you. Um, I wanted to know, was this piece uh, something that came to you, inspired after that decision? And did it come to you in a creative rush where you worked and worked and worked? Or did it develop more slowly as you applied your process? Excellent. Fran, question for you. How did you get led into this particular painting? Well, when I started um, studying this painting, there's so much music in it, and I didn't want to upset my guest, Mary, who I didn't know at the time. Um, but, um, but as I studied it, and I studied all these colors and movement and passion, um, I just you know, started to feel that it had to relate to our world around us and where we are today. And that um, even though things are difficult and there's chaos, if you will, um, you know, we don't give into that. And if we do give into that, then, you know, then we have destroyed ourselves. But my answer to it was, no, let's not buy into this. Let's recognize it and work and and come out better for it. Great. So I um, purchased Fran's writing, and with her permission, it's going to go on my website for this piece. Oh, yay. Thank you both so much. If we have time at the end, we'll do more Q&A for each of the groups. But um, meanwhile, I'd like to call Donna Argenbrock back up to the stage from LAA to introduce the next pairing. Thank you, Linda. So I am pleased to introduce our initiator artist, Kim Wolf. Kim's chosen medium is wood. She turns it on a lathe with traditional tools to create her art. In 2016, a beginner's wood turning class sparked her creative journey in wood. Today, she is a wood turning instructor at the same program in Pleasant Hill through Mount Diablo Adult Ed Lifelong Learning. In this piece, she departs from her usual path of creating utilitarian objects so I'd like to turn this over now to Kim 
and let her describe her new journey with her piece to Soro Marino. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> Kim. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'll have to lean over or bend my knees. Or raise it so that it can just be lowered in five minutes. <laughs> um, first, I want to start out by asking, does anyone out, out here um, remember your first interaction with seaweed? With seaweed. Wow, we got two hands. Three. Three, four, five. Well, guess what? I'm not really with you on that one. I have forgotten my first interaction with seaweed, but I do have a grandchild. And we took him to the beach, and I got to live vicariously through his experiences. And he was absolutely in awe. You know, it wasn't just a green thing in the sand, but what was it? Was it alive? And I thought to myself, I need more of that kind of discovery and awe in my daily life. And so today, while when I go out into the great outdoors, I focus on what I might find as if it's a treasure hunt. And so this piece, Tesoro Marino, which I'm not pronouncing correctly either, and Jennifer's gonna do that for us next. Um, <laughs> it's inspired by my walks at the Sea Ranch in Northern California. And in 1846, um, the area that we now know as Sea Ranch was a, a Mexican land grant, and that inspired the title of the piece. So Tesoro Marino is also sea treasure. And it's not a replica of any one thing that I saw on my walks. It's rather an imaginary living thing that is put together from elements that I have seen on my walks there. And I hope that it creates a sense of wonder for its viewer. My process is very simple. I observe. I walk, I observe, I look at the light as it hits the leaves and the grasses. I notice the deeply rich hues of the fungus growing on the forest floor and the lichen attached to the trees and the texture. There is so much texture in nature. And I just absolutely have fallen in love with the texture of seaweed and of the salt buildup of anything along the ocean. And I do s not do any sketching while I'm out in nature. I just feel, you know, be one with nature, enjoy my feelings. And I take a lot of photos, but the photos are not actually used to create any of the art. They're just used to jog my memory and to help me remember the feeling that I've associated with whatever it was I was looking at. And then next I go into the studio and I take an inventory of my wood. And most wood turners are wood hoarders. So there's always something in the inventory of wood that will align with my concepts. I place the wood on a lathe, and the lathe is simply a tool that spins wood quickly. Wood turning has been around since 300 BC. However, my lathe is quite posh compared to that of our ancestors. It goes faster, it's easier for me to use, and in fact, it goes in reverse. So the body of Tesoro is hollowed out, and I can't see what I'm doing while I do that. So it's a dance with the wood. And if I have one mistake, the piece can blow up. If I turn the tool the wrong way, the piece can launch itself from the lathe. 
And so the mantra for many wood turners is keep the wood on the lathe. And every piece is turned on the lathe. It's colored, it's textured, it's assembled, and voila. Obviously, this one stayed on the lathe. And now to introduce the writer responder to Kim's piece is Ruth Stanton, our Vice President of Exhibitions. Thank you, Donna. I have the pleasure of introducing a very talented artist and author, Jennifer Granat. Uh, she wears multiple hats. She's also a member of LAA and is our editor and produces uh, six newsletters for uh, LAA throughout the year. She is going to read her poem titled Sir Ancestral. So please welcome Jennifer Granat. Well, as a writer, I have reformatted this, so, but it's very similar. As you know, writers and artists, we all pick on everything <laughs> and keep redoing and redoing. Well, oh, sorry. So the poem I am about to read is called Ser Ancestral, which translates into ancestral being. Because the title of this beautiful wood-turned sculpture is Tesoro Marino, or sea treasure in English, I decided to experiment with a play back and forth between Spanish and English. My intention is to invite the reader to experience the poem in two different languages. You must excuse my Spanish pronunciation, however, as I am not a native speaker and have only recently begun to relearn Spanish as a second language. I would like to thank Rosa Fallon for help with this translation. Without further ado, here is Ser Ancestral. Tesoro Marino, ancestral being. Quien eres? Who are you? Do you contain the same maternal mitochondria as I? Contiendes la misma materna mitochondria que yo? Answers bubble forth complex meaning, posing more questions. Las respuestas brotan significados complejos, planteando más preguntas. ¿Eres un recipiente? Are you a vessel? Can you quench thirst? ¿Puedes saciar la sed? Puedo ver mucho en ti, que también está en mí. I can see so much in you that is also in me. You are of earth, fire, air, water. Eres de tierra, fuego, aire, agua. Eres elemental. You are elemental. Todavía, as much as I, you live, breathe. Yet, como yo, tú vives aliento. Pero, ¿qué eres? ¿Qué yo? But what are you? What am I? No matter, tesoro marino. No importa, tesoro. Ancestral being. I am proud to know you. Estoy orgullosa de conocerte ser ancestral. Eres profunda y hermosa. You are profound and beautiful. Tesoro marino ser ancestral. Thank you, Jennifer. Are there any questions from the audience? Kim and uh, uh, Jennifer, would you all like to come up? Oh, there's a 
Marilyn. I'm interested in the color of the main part of the vessel. You said you added the color. Um, there is color added. How, how and what? Did you explain, Kim, how you did the little round pieces? The round pieces are, in fact, turned into a blue and a red. And then I used the biography tool to burn the top into the text that you can see. And you can mark the um, bright edge with the crow for the color of the Roman tower to, to be a top. My question is actually two parts. Uh, first, for Jennifer, your piece was beautiful. Um, you read so much into that. So what was it that prompted that? And then, Kim, I'd like to know your response to what she wrote. So when, when I saw Kim's piece, I, it immediately, I, know what, I knew what Tesoro Marino meant, sea treasure, and it just, um, I love the sea and everything to do with it, and um, I just it just came out of me what I wanted to say about this, and it reminded me of the fact that we come from the sea and um, the beauty of the creatures that inhabit the sea, and it, it was just such an inspiration to me that I chose her piece to write a poem about, and um, that's it. I loved well, it. I really wish that Jennifer at one point offered to send me it so it could be written, and I held off. I wanted to just give it to her. So I read it today, and I felt as if she had been there Next, I'd like to introduce Bill Carmel. He's with La Miranda Arts Council and is on their board. He is also uh, the mastermind and the curator of this fabulous exhibition. So welcome, Bill. Thank you, Ruth and Donna. I have the honor to be on the board for the La Mirinda Arts Council and the one of the curators for this wonderful exhibition space. There are a few things that I want to tell you about the La Mirinda Arts Council and that is it was founded in 1950 and has been a continuous source of inspiration for artists and it allows artists of all ages to participate in the various programs that they offer. They have two galleries, this one here in the library and also at Wilder. In its transition from COVID, Wilder has not opened, so we decided to 
make the Wilder exhibit virtual. So there are artists who exhibit their works virtually and when that space opens up again, we'll re reuse it as a, a brick and mortar kind of gallery. There are other programs that are sponsored by the organization. There's Art Embraces Words that Elena Olosky has uh, begun and continues to uh, inspire both writers and artists. And Art Embraces Poetry and Art Embraces Music. These are programs that are developing and have begun and will continue in the future. There's also Artify Arinda, which you see in the various uh, mechanical uh, boxes around Arinda. They're being uh, used to display artwork and also there are a couple of opportunities for murals that are being explored. All of this is about bringing art to everyone in everyday life. This is an extremely valuable part of what the Art Council is about. It's not only about seeing the work that artists do, it's about experiencing it as you go about your daily activities downtown. And then there's the art exhibits, the art ambassadors exhibit, and also the um, visual arts competition. The visual arts competition is for the high school students and the art ambassadors is for the K through eight students. This is extremely important that children understand that their creativity is valued. It's real. It's not something that is just put up on the refrigerator door. As a society, we value the creativity of the people who are going to inhabit our town after we're no longer here. So there is uh, another program that the arts, uh, La Mirinda Arts Council supports and that is La Mirinda Idol. This is a huge endeavor and it is extremely popular because it gives young people a chance to perform. Performance is another extremely valuable activity that kids love to do, but rarely are they given a professional kind of format for their work. The mission of La Mirinda Arts Council is to ignite and sustain artistic expression and appreciation for all ages. And I think you can see by what's going on outside that it's really happening. And we love doing it. About a hundred years ago, there was this guy named Keats who wrote a little metaphor about truth and beauty. He said, truth is beauty, and beauty is truth. This is something that I read when I was in high school, and I wanted to believe it really badly. Because most of what I saw was not that. I had an idea of what truth was, and I had an idea of what beauty was. And it turned out that what was really going on was I was beginning an exploration. There's another person who talked about truth and beauty and that's Eleanor Roosevelt. And so I'm gonna paraphrase what she said and that is no matter how plain a person may be, if truth and honesty are written on their face, they will be beautiful. I think this is one of the things that we see often in an artist's work where the truth 
of what is really going on in the world is there for a person to experience. And I have uh, a metaphor that I want to offer to you, and that is looking uncovers the extraordinary. Beauty must be found. So the idea of ekphrasis is that artists create, authors create, and we can improvise off of what it is that we see. The improvisation is something that is an extraordinary creative endeavor and it's something that I really enjoy and I know a lot of the artists and authors enjoy it too. It's evident. So what I would like to do now is introduce our ekphrasis uh, artist, Jill Hedgecock. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, so I am a switch hitter. So I both um, responded to two art pieces and also um, was the art initiator on this piece. So when I um, thought about what I wanted to uh, do um, in terms of uh, an art piece, I actually thought a lot about the writer as well. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to give the writer a lot of um, senses to work with so um, you'll see uh, that there's this really nice fuzzy blanket so that the writer, if he chose to do this, I have not read Al's piece yet, so I'm so excited. Um, uh, but um, so I wanted him to give the, like, the fuzziness of the blanket. You know, they're, both of the um, people in this uh, piece are like snuggled down in a blanket, so there's this touch, warmth. Um, so the sense of touch was present. And um, also the, uh, the potential to bring in sound. Um, because you could imagine that maybe one or both of these individuals are snoring. There's maybe a light snore. Or, more importantly, that there's silence. There is no baby crying in this picture. Um, hence the, the title, which is uh, Contentment. Um, but also, of course, there's lots of visuals. I mean, that's what visual art is. So I put the little um, bit of pink on there to, you know, suggest strongly that it's a little girl here. And also, um, I also wanted to um, uh, uh, put the face, you know, the facial hair on on the the male figure, kind of to suggest that maybe this is. Uh, a very uh, tired individual that maybe the, the baby has um, kept this individual up a bit. Um, and also, um, I used very muted tones because I wanted to sort of give the sense of um, the, the lighting. There's maybe it's kind of late afternoon that maybe they're both taking a little siesta. And also... Um, uh, the perspective of it, I thought about that as well. So the viewer is potentially <clears throat> on their knees kind of looking straight on this, um, this scene because I wanted to give a sense of intimacy. Um, so um, just backing up just a little bit to, uh, to tell you a little bit about my artist journey. So I um, have only returned to the arts. I was a very avid painter in, in high school and as a, a teen. And then I sort of went off to the sciences um, for my career. Um, but when I retired about a little less than two years ago, I started taking art classes. And one of the things that um, I definitely couldn't do when I was in high school was draw people. And as fate would have it, um, when I returned to art, the only um, art class that fit my schedule was portraits. <laughs> Um, but um, my uh, art teacher, who's um, uh, 
Melissa Hartman, Herman, Melissa Herman, uh, she said something to me. She said, well, faces are just um, uh, shapes and values, and it's so true. Granted, you have to be very precise in them, and it just blew it open for me, and I absolutely love to draw people. And I'm still trying to discover who I am as an artist, but one of the things that I definitely want to pursue is that I really want people, when they view my art, to either smile or say, aww. Um, so I'm looking for that sort of emotional connection with, um, with the viewers. Um, and then um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the title. I thought long and hard about what to call this because uh, in reality, uh, this is a picture of my son-in-law and his niece. It's not a father-daughter. Um, but I also um, appreciate what Bill just said, that it's just, um, you know, it's what people get out of it. And what I really wanted people to get out of this piece is just this feeling of contentment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. And now I'd like to introduce Al Garado, who wrote the poem responding to Jill's piece, Contentment. Good afternoon. I've asked the uh, camera person not to put the picture of my uh, uh, writing up there for you uh, because this painting that Jill did so beautifully uh, requires uh, sound. I hope to give you some sound in the words that I read. And so, it's called, If Miracles Happen. Eyes closed, yet fully alert. Not much sleep, day or night. Since this, this amazing handful of nearly weightless flesh and bone arrived home. Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. Where did I hear that? Shakespeare? Sounds biblical. Why does it come to mind? I wonder, why do only women get to experience this intimate, terrifying, nine months of bonding, housing, feeding, nourishing, nurturing. All I could do these endless months, watch, and wish I'd had some part any part in carrying this amazing miracle child inside my body. Thank you, God. For what? For letting him come into the world intact with all his pieces and parts whole and functioning. Let it always be so. If miracles happen, really, I just live through one. And it's begun. It comes with a promise to keep on giving. Till when? I can't bear the thought of his not being with us forever. 
Can I live forever? Can my wife, this little guy next to me, will the day come when all human beings can live in peace forever? Is there such a thing as happily alive ever after? After what? I can't even say the D word. I want so much to believe in an endless hereafter. Just turned 30 and already seen so much, too much. I hate the word death. I've had nightmares, recurring terrors, not so much anymore. Did what I could. Got some frantic Afghan moms, dads, newborns, kids, teens, off the cobble runway, barely the clothes on their backs, to safety, somewhere. Is there even a safe somewhere? Or is safe a fantasy, a dream that comes, goes, but doesn't exist? Not in the real world. What if it had been my wife on that plane and this miracle next to me? Erase, erase. Live in the moment. Love what's now. Be the best I can be. Protect him with my life. Oh, my right arm's asleep can't move though, can't get up, don't want to. Why interrupt the best hour of my life? So sleep, arm, sleep any fiber of my being that needs to. Me? I'm staying awake like a night watchman. I may never sleep again until, till when? He's 18? No, at 18, I felt indestructible, took too many foolish risks. 21? False bravado, terrified of responsibility then why the Air Force? A way of what? Challenging death? Cheating fate? Fool. Today I want to live forever with my beloved and our baby to see his bride and children, yeah, and their kids too. Happily ever after? A pipe dream or just maybe a wonderful real life dream. Thank you, Al. And now it's time for questions for Jill and Al. I have a question for each of you. How long did it take you, Al, to write that until you were satisfied? And same question for you, Jill.
the terrible thing about being a writer is that you're never satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I was making changes to this this morning, <laughs> long after it was posted outside. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, and maybe that's good. Maybe writers should never be satisfied with what they write uh, because it can always be better. Uh, it's never done. <laughs> uh, same, same thing. You always feel like there's something uh, more that you could uh, do. Um, but I will say um, that this is colored pencil, and it, it kind of demands a lot of um, intricate detail. Um, so it, it, it took me probably a good week to get something that was turn in and then I just kept kind of messing with it <laughs> up until it was time to turn it in, basically. I have a question. The question that I have is about the intimacy that I feel is in your piece and yours. Do you know each other? We do. Uh, yes. Okay. I'd be interested to hear I didn't about know, that. I didn't know that Jill was going to be the artist until today, though. But we've known each other for several years. Yeah, I um, I uh, I've known Al for many years through the California Writers Club, but um, I only recently found out that he was the. And I actually didn't read um, this, and I'm just thrilled with what he wrote. Um, uh, but I think that w one of the things that I was trying to um, elicit from uh, the viewer of this piece was intimacy. That's kind of why I, the, the, you know, you're kind of looking straight on on these two individuals. And so I'm really, really glad that um, Al picked up on that and, and put it in the, the emotion of what he wrote. Okay. Um, I had a question. Um, for Jill, like, um, what was what were you thinking? What, what was your reaction to the response to your art? Oh, it was it was fantastic. I mean, I I love that art is is subject to interpretation from what the viewer uh, uh, takes from it, and I love this idea of it was almost like a, a life story of of you know this young man who. Um, you know, went into the Air Force and, and how he lived through his 20s and how he wants to be protective of this child. I think it's just a, a great interpretation. So, Al, you just found out today that Jill was your pairing and Jill, when did you find out? Uh, like two days ago. Two days ago. So how did it make each of you feel, knowing each other and knowing that you landed on the same process of ekphrasis, responding to each other together? Well, I'll start because um, I was actually at a California Writers uh, Club meeting, and, and Linda said to me, you're going to be so thrilled with who... Um, who chose your piece to write about. And I'm not kidding. I said, I hope it's Al. I literally thought, I hope it's Al. So you cannot imagine how excited I was when I found out it was Al. Like, what were the odds? Uh, yeah, just so thrilled. I have to admit that I, I never associated Jill with art work, the visual art. Uh, she's a wonderful writer and has been a great friend and great uh, uh, benefit to our branch of the uh, California Writers Club. And uh, so I was shocked when I read it yesterday on the form that was sent out to me that I was going to be reading and that Jill was the artist. And I, oh my gosh, <laughs> I couldn't believe it, <laughs> but I'm glad. Okay.
Okay, so now how many people in the room understand ECFASIS a little better? Yay! So we got somewhere today. I'm really thrilled about that. Um, thank you for all the presenters. I really appreciate it. I do want to say a few words about the California Writers Club as well. Um, we are located in Pleasant Hill. Basically, we have monthly meetings at Zio Fredo's. But in addition to having speakers and workshops for the monthly meetings, we also have open mic nights on Zoom. There's a writer's connection group that meets, just a group of creatives that meets at the end of every month down at the chicken pie shop in Walnut Creek to talk about whatever it is they're working on or to read a piece or to discuss some topic that has come up in the news about writing or writers. And GPT is like a big thing now, chat GPT with writers, AI, et cetera, artificial intelligence kind of changing the way that we look at what can be done and how to use that as potentially a tool or a danger. I don't know which. We're still working on that one. Um, but we, we have a lot of fun together, and the group has grown to be about 140 people now um, in just our branch. And we are one of 22 branches throughout the state of California. We're one of the larger branches, but uh, not the largest. I think Redwood up in Sonoma is about the largest. But if anyone is interested in learning more about it, there's some brochures outside, and just contact the links that are in there, and we'd be glad to talk to you more. Um, I would like to um, have all the people who helped volunteer to put this together today stand up. If you made a contribution in some way, shape, or form today, please stand up. Okay. Exhibitors, you don't need to be shy. <laughs> um, I want to thank Ela Elena Olaski, who has been more than helpful working with our team and in the background of our team since we pulled together the five primary people. Elena has been there through thick and thin, and she knows how to do these things. Um, Stanford Stewart also was very helpful in during the installation and in schlepping things back and forth today. It rather takes an army sometimes. I want to thank all of our volunteers who came to help us put the food out, make sure people had beverages, make sure they had name tags. I want to thank the um, McConnell's, or McDonald's rather, nursery, who provided the gorgeous flowers, which um, I would like all of the people who volunteered to help to be sure to pick one out and take it home. They're four inch annuals, and there's like 40 or so of them, maybe 48. So please take one home, volunteers first, and then I would like um, for the rest of you who are interested in giving a plant a nice home to take one with you. Um, I would like to thank Mayor Miller for coming and joining us today. I know she has a very busy schedule, as well as Sue Farmer, the president of the um, La Miranda Arts Council. So who am I missing? Oh, yes, Mount Di or not Mount Di I always call it Mount Diablo Foods. Diablo Foods, um, in-kind donation of a beautiful vegetable tray. And help me out, Elena. Saffron. Ah, yes, Saffron, the Indian restaurant. Lovely pakoras with three different sauces to choose from. Um, thank you to Desired Effects of San Francisco for helping us with the audiovisual. We really appreciate your being here and helping us get a video of this event today. And now I'd like to take any additional questions from the audience, if there are any. Please raise your hand. And if not, I would like to invite you out to the gallery to visit with the artists and the writers who are there with their pieces. You can ask them all the questions that you want, even the ones that didn't come up and present today because we only had so much time to use the auditorium. 
There's plenty of light refreshments and beverages, so please make yourself at home and enjoy the exhibition. And thank you for coming. We really, really appreciate. We appreciate more than you know your support of the arts in La Mirinda. Yeah.